This is Lecture Note 4, Price Level, which provides an introduction to the notion of prices that we'll use to build the vertical axis of our aggregate demand, aggregate supply model later in the course. Now, unlike the micro world, in the macro world, we don't use price in the market for a single good, but rather a measure of average prices in the economy overall. I list a collection of references I use while creating my notes. This includes our text and many others, and you're not actually responsible for the content of these other texts, of course. We'll discuss consumer price index, CPI, inflation, the GDP deflator, cost of living, and two causes of inflation. First, an example of inflation to motivate. So back in 2006, Zimbabwe needed money to pay off its army. With inflation already at 50% per year, the government decided to flood the economy with 60 trillion Zimbabwean dollars. Predictably, they experienced hyperinflation. Printing a Zimbabwean dollar actually reduced the value of the paper used. What, inflation is an increase in the average level of prices, typically measured using changes in a price index. A price index is the average price from a representative basket of goods and services in the economy. The inflation rate is just the percentage change in the price index from one year to the next. So formally, this is just the price in period 2 minus the price in period 1 divided by the price in period 1. Then this whole ratio times 100. A 2% inflation rate means that goods are priced 2% higher than the base year. Inflation is distinct from the typical price fluctuations we see in the equilibrium price caused by supply and demand shocks. Inflation refers to changes in the average level of all prices. Inflation means on average prices have risen. Though it's possible the prices of some goods may have decreased during this time. We have many price indices to measure inflation. Consumer price index, the GDP deflator, and producer price index. The CPI comes from the Bureau of Labor Statistics, BLS. It reports the price of a market basket of goods presumably purchased by a typical urban consumer covers around 80,000 goods in something like 200 categories. And it's weighted so that an increase in the price of a major item like housing costs more than the rise in price of paper towels, for instance. The CPI for any particular year is found by taking the price of the market basket in that year divided by the price estimate for the same market basket in the base year. Then that ratio times 100. The CPI for the base year is always 100. The BLS sets the base year as 1982 to 1984 for the consumer price index. So the consumer price index is equal to 100 for that year in the United States. So here's an exercise. Suppose the market basket includes two goods, meat and bread. And we want to find the CPI for 2013 with 2006 as the base year. For meat, there's a quantity of 10 at a price of $11 in 2006 and a quantity of 10 at a price of $9 in 2013. For bread, there's a quantity of 15 at a price of $6 in 2006 and a quantity of 15 at a price of $10 in 2013. We want to find the CPI in 2013. So we need to compute the cost of the market basket in 2013 and divide by the cost of the same basket in 2006, then multiply by 100. The cost of the basket in 2013 is 240. The cost of the basket in 2006 is 200. So the CPI is 240 divided by 200 times 100, which is 120. So here's another exercise. Suppose we have eggs and bacon. We have a quantity of three eggs in both 2014 and 2015 and a quantity of four bacon in 2014 and 2015. The price of eggs in 2014 is $20 and it's $25 in 2015. The price of bacon is $12 in 2014 and $18 in 2015. We need to find the CPI in 2015 using 2014 as the base year. So we compute the cost of the market basket in 2015 and divide by the cost of the same basket in 2014, then multiply by 100. The cost of the basket in 2015 is 147. The cost is 108 in 2014. So the CPI is 147 divided by 108 times 100, which is 136.1. The rate of inflation using the consumer price index is found by comparing one year's index with the index from the previous year in percentage terms. So the inflation in year two is the CPI in year two minus the CPI in year one divided by the CPI in year one times 100. 
For example, if the CPI was 195 in 2005 and 188.9 in 2004, then the rate of inflation for 2005 is 195.3 minus 188.9 divided by 188.9 times 100, which is 3.4%. Here's another exercise. Recall for our example with meat and bread, the CPI was 120. We want to find the inflation rate in 2013 using 2006 as the base. So we take the CPI for 2013, which is 120, the CPI for 2006, which is 100 because it's just the base year, this is going to tell us the inflation rate is 20%. Here's one more exercise. Recall from our earlier eggs and bacon example, the CPI was 136.1. So we want the inflation rate for 2015 with 2014 as the base year. So we take the CPI in 2015 minus the CPI in 2014 over the CPI in 2014, the whole thing times 100. Or 136.1 minus 100 divided by 100 times 100 is 36.1%. A GDP deflator is another price index. It's the ratio of nominal to real GDP multiplied by 100. It's going to cover all final goods since it's based on GDP, gross domestic product. The GDP deflator measures the current price level relative to the prices of the base year. Here's an exercise. Suppose real GDP was 32 trillion and nominal GDP was 28 trillion. Find the GDP deflator. Well, the GDP deflator is nominal GDP, 28, divided by real GDP, 32, times 100. So it's 87.5. Here's another exercise. If real GDP is 5 trillion and GDP deflator is 200, find nominal GDP. Well, the GDP deflator is 200 is equal to nominal GDP over real GDP, which is 5. So solving nominal GDP is 10 trillion. Now both the consumer price index and gross domestic product deflator are useful, but they don't always coincide. The GDP deflator uses, all the, uses the prices of all final goods and services, but the consumer price index uses just the prices of consumption goods and services only. So naturally there's going to be some differences. Also, the GDP deflator weights each item using information about current and past quantities, but the CPI weights using information only from a past consumer expenditure survey. So the GDP deflator incorporates quantity impro quality improvements and substitution effects in a way that consumer price index does not. Now while in principle the GDP deflator might not have the same issues as the consumer price index, it actually does in practice. The physical quantities produced are not directly measured. Instead, expenditures are divided by price indices, one of which is the consumer price index. Now, The producer price index measures the average price received by producers. This counts both final and intermediate goods, unlike the GDP deflator and CPI. There's producer price indices for a variety of industries. Now while we have a few different price indices to use, typically consumer price index is the preferred measure to think about the effects of inflation on average citizens. So typically we focus on CPI unless otherwise noted. There's some issues with the CPI. Notably the composition of the market basket is non-constant over time. There's changes in the types of items. New goods are introduced or innovations replace obsolete goods. This introduces some error into the measure, even though the, C the CPI is designed to account for this. One goal of using the consumer price index to measure, one goal of using the consumer price index is the idea to measure changes in the cost of living. We want to think about the income increase necessary to maintain a certain standard of living when prices are rising. Now the CPI is sub subject to substitution bias in that prices do not change proportionally year to year, meaning that consumers can respond by switching to less expensive alternatives, which can lead to the cost of living being overstated year to year. Another issue is the introduction of new goods. This gives consumers more variety and reduces the cost of maintaining a given level of well-being as a result. But the consumer price index does not re reflect the increase in the value of a dollar that results from an increase in the variety of goods available to purchase. There's also unmeasured quality changes, as hinted at earlier. If quality rises from year to year, the value of the dollar rises. The BLS tries to maintain a basket of constant quality, but quality is really difficult to measure and capture. 
So the average inflation rate in the United States since 1950 has been about 3.3%. During the 1970s it was higher and more recently it's been much lower, like around 2.4% or lower. So a basket that cost $10 in 1913 would cost about $36.17 in 1969, $100 in 1982 because that's the base year, and $233 in 2013. See, the consumer price index is used to compute real prices, those corrected for inflation. And real prices are used to compare the prices of goods over time. An example is gas prices. If gas was $1.25 per gallon in 1982 and $2.50 per gallon in 2006, we don't automatically consume that gas is twice as expensive in 2006. The CPI was 100 in 1982 because that's the base year and it turned out at about 202 in 2006. The price of most goods did double, but wages rose as well. And it turns out actually, relative to other prices in the economy, the real price of gas was about the same in 2006 as in 1982. So now in order to compute dollar figures from year T in today's dollars, we use the following formula. The amount in today's dollars is equal to the amount in year T dollars times the price level today divided by the price level in year T. So here's an exercise to illustrate. Suppose the CPI in 19, is, suppose the consumer price index is 172 in 2013 and it was 46.5 in 1992. Suppose $1,000 was put aside in 1992, how much would be needed in 2013 to be able to buy what you could have had with $1,000 in 1992? So we apply the formula. The amount in today's dollars is 1,000 times 172 divided by 46.5, or approximately $3,698.72. Now recent U.S. inflation has been relatively modest. Zimbabwe's was much higher, too high, 735% uh, from 2002 to 2007. Then from 2008, they had astonishingly high inflation. And Japan's at the other extreme with an inflation rate of 0 0.03, and that's not highly desirable either. Now, there's a few different sources of inflation. Demand pull inflation arises when there's too much money chasing too few goods. This occurs when the money supply is too large, when resources are already full employ fully employed, and firms cannot respond to excess demand by raising output. Cost push inflation occurs when there's factors leading to an increase in the per unit production costs. Then output falls while prices rise. So costs are pushing the price level upward. So here we covered CPI, inflation, GDP deflator, cost of living, and two causes of inflation.